If you ask people, do you care about fixing the climate, an incredibly high percentage of people say yes. They always lowball how much other people care. Do you think maybe part of the issue lies in sort of over-intellectualising of the problem? I'm Tallulah and I'm a second year undergraduate at Worcester College. Steve Smith, I'm an associate professor um, of greenhouse gas removal. Has that always been your field of research? Well, I've started off as a physicist um, originally, that was my undergraduate, um, and I studied clouds for my PhD. Pretty soon after my PhD, I got involved as a scientist in government looking at UK climate policy. I'm very focused and interested in the net part of net zero, which is the greenhouse gas removal part. So I saw that you've either contributed to or authored some books on climate change for children. So what were the sort of difficulties you faced then in translating those technical academic terms into those that are easily digestible? And also, what do you think the impact can be of educating particularly the younger generation earlier on? At school, I got nothing about climate change. Whereas I think um, perhaps for you growing up, it's become much more of a thing in education. And you're obviously interested in climate change, but you're not a scientist. so. What are you studying right now and, and how do you link that, if at all, to climate change? So I study philosophy and theology um, and I mean there's sort of a plethora of ways in which one could link it. The university does offer modules like eco-theology, there's also, which a personal interest, there's eco-feminist theology which finds sort of immense both explanation and the chance of solution or positive action in the sort of interrelation between the oppression and domination of women and the planet. But I think philosophy just has an immense role to play sort of above and beyond every discipline. Um, so I read that you played sort of quite a significant part in formulating the UK's net zero target. How direct of an impact do you think advisors can have on government policy when it comes to climate change? Well, there, there are lots of people involved in the target, so I definitely wasn't the only one. So far, um, Parliament has legislated those targets that the Climate Change Committee has recommended, and so far, we've actually met those targets. Big question about whether we'll get all the way to net zero by 2050, which is where we're aiming for. Do you think that you've, there's been a big change in government policy over the past 30 years? Do you think maybe where there was initially resistance to integrating climate policy? Do you think? It's been positive enough? It's been positive. So 2008 was the big year when the Climate Change Act was passed. And it was passed because both the Labour government at the time and the Conservative uh, opposition decided that they, they were all behind doing something on climate. The other big change actually is my first job when I, was, uh, uh, when I joined the Climate Change Committee was to advise on the 2050 target and we advised it should be at least an 80% reduction below 1990 levels. And then my career sort of came full circle when we were asked by government um, what should be the target in light of the Paris Agreement and uh, the new global goal of staying below 1.5 degrees. And actually, we changed the 2050 target. We upgraded it from at least 80% to at least 100%, which is effectively net zero. So actually, the ambition has increased um, over the last decade or so. So how would you say your friends and peers view the future, particularly future of the climate we live in? Are you optimistic or, or pessimistic or something else? I mean, I would love to say I'm optimistic. I think it's hard sometimes though to feel that way. Our generation has done the least to contribute to the problem and yet, uh, maybe well, the last or at least the generation with which it feels a lot of the onus lies for solving the problem. One of the things actually when we were writing the Usborne children's book we were quite keen to put in was making sure that people have a balanced sense of what they can do because there are things individuals can do but there are a lot of things they can't do. They can do things individually domestically in their own homes their own families and they can choose a career path to maybe have a big influence or they can choose to lobby their MPs or heads of big companies, but we can't do everything individually. And yes, it, 
part of the complexity of the problem is it's going to take action on multiple levels. It's not just that government has the solution or big business has the solution or yeah. individuals do. It's this complicated dance which makes it hard. But on the flip side means that everyone can do something if they choose to. I think describing it as a dance is a lovely way of putting it because, I mean, ultimately the, the issue is all of ours to share. Regarding everyday behaviour, do you think, and if so, why do you think the issue of cognitive dissonance is so rife? If you ask people, do you care about fixing the climate? Do you, are you willing to take action to reduce your emissions? Uh, an incredibly high percentage of people say yes. And then if you ask them, do you think other people care about climate? They always lowball um, what they think other people, um, how much other people care. So we have this strange cognitive dissonance in the sense that lots of people are willing, but they underestimate how much everyone else is willing. And I think that, unfortunately, has sometimes uh, meant that we don't go as fast as, as actually people are willing to go on this. Yeah. Do you think maybe part of the issue lies in sort of over-intellectualising of the problem? Do you think that can lead people to believe that they aren't sufficiently equipped? Perhaps. I mean, this is a problem that's been identified by scientists. We love talking in technical terms. And as researchers, we're always interested in the cutting edge. So where are the uncertainties? What are the things we don't know? As intellectuals, being drawn to the uncertainties and the grey parts is, is not always helpful, although it's good to be honest about those things. When we were looking back in the early 2000s at how we decarbonise electricity, we said it's probably a mix of nuclear power, carbon capture and storage, uh, and some renewables. Um, and what's happened is the renewables have really taken off and they've come down in costs way faster than we expected. Building nuclear plants has been a lot more expensive and slower than we expected. So uh, we're still learning as we go along, even though we've got a pretty clear picture. Just before we have to conclude, I would love to know what you think is next in your specific field of research for climate change. Oh, that's a great question. Um, emissions come from a whole range of things. About 70% of emissions are energy related, so electricity, transport, heat and light. But then there's another 30% which is about the way we use land, it's industrial processes, making cement and steel and basic things like that. So I think a challenge is actually going into some of those things that are a bit harder to decarbonise and also to scale up ways of taking greenhouse gases back out of the atmosphere because to the extent we can't get everything down to zero in the time we need to, we're going to need some removals to counterbalance those residual emissions. And who knows, if we end up in a, in a climate in a generation or two's time, which is really uncomfortable, we might want to give future generations the option to actually go net negative in terms of emissions and take CO2 out of the atmosphere. What are the next steps for you? I'd love to eventually maybe do a master's or something along those lines in an area of related to the climate, unfortunately. I don't think physics or anything of that sort is on the horizon. Well, still plenty to do, so we can keep talking. Yes, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure.